Hello and welcome to Good or Bad, Jurassic Park. It was one of the biggest and most jaw-dropping movies of the 90s. Then we got a less impressive and much more dividing sequel, The Lost World. And then we got a kick in the bollocks called Jurassic Park 3. Directed by Joe Johnston and released in 2001. This, for me, is where the franchise really hit the low point. You know, that low point that takes 14 years to come back from. The movie kicks off at Isla Sauna, the island from the second movie, where we see some thrill seekers seeking a thrill. This guy called Does It Really Matter? He's going to die off screen in a minute anyway. He wants to show this kid called Eric! Yes, thank you, Amanda. Now, would you kindly piss off? I will allot to appropriate screen time later. But yes, he wants to show Eric! I already don't like you, and we haven't even gotten to your first scene yet. He wants to show Eric who was played by Trevor Morgan, some dinosaurs, because it'll be cool. <laughs> oh, would you look at that? The movie has jokes. Very clever. Okay, so yeah, the people on the boat got eaten by a Stephen King novel, which means they have no choice but to untether themselves and glide to the island. Wow, the dinosaur effects have really gone downhill since the last movie. So here we have Sam Neill returning from the first movie as Alan Grant, and also returning is Laura Dern as Ellie Sattler, who we would like to believe are together in this film as the ending of the first movie did indicate, which would certainly explain why Alan just so happens to be in the same scene as Ellie when the movie starts. But no, he's just visiting. She's actually married to this guy. Now why would Alan be visiting? I mean, beyond just getting Laura Dern in this movie. Well, to catch up and talk about raptors, of course. And then he buggers off. We see that his dig site is struggling and they are in need of funds. So when the Kirby show up, played by William H. Macy and Taya Leone, they tell Alan and Billy they have a proposition, so they attend dinner to hear them out. Oh, I should point out this is Billy. He works for Alan at the dig site. And despite the movie giving us the impression they are equal partners, the movie also clearly states that Alan pays him. It's not really important. Point is, he's in the movie. And Billy is played by Alessandro Nivola. So what is the offer they want to make? Well, Paul and Amanda Kirby say they want Alan to accompany them while they fly over Isla Sauna, so Alan can essentially be a tour guide. But they assure him they are only going to fly over the island. But they have a hidden agenda. They are looking for their son Eric, who after going parasailing has gone missing. So after stating earlier in the movie that no force on Earth or Heaven could get him on that island, he gets convinced quite easily by the sound of a checkbook opening. Hasn't his character grown since the first movie? But in the movie's defence, he was told that they would only be flying over. But then when does that ever go to plan? So they board the plane and off they go. And this next scene is probably the one that gets ripped into the most. Alan has a little snooze on the plane and then this happens. <laughs> You know you're in for a good time when the first dinosaur you see in a Jurassic Park movie is a talking raptor. Dream or not, it's still stupid. But the worst part is that it makes sense that he would have nightmares, especially on the plane because he knows he is going to be closer to the dinosaurs than he has been ever since the park. So imagine a proper dream sequence. It wouldn't have to make sense. I mean, don't have them talk, just have Alan wake up and he sees a bunch of raptors on the plane devouring everyone and brutally, well, a PG version of brutal, but it would still be better than this. Alan! So they see some dinosaurs, but when there's talk of landing, Alan starts to protest, which is when he gets a whack on the head. And when he wakes up, he discovers they have landed. Which leads to Amanda making a lot of noise, drawing the attention of something big, which of course means people get eaten and they crash the plane while trying to flee. Should have brought a helicopter. I mean, beyond the obvious advantage of it not taking as long to get into the air, it would have given more credibility to that bullcrap tour guide story. But Jurassic Park has never done a plane crash, so I guess it had to be a plane. And what I find funny is that the first couple of people that die are the two experts they brought along to keep them safe. And the movie even went out of its way to say this. Well, that's right. I, them two of the very best men I could possibly find. Oh, and they also got in the line for the trailer. It's gonna be a walk in the park. Was very subtle. So yeah, the plane crash. It was okay, I guess, but they showed way too much of the new dinosaur, which is later known as the Spinosaurus. 
And I understand that in sequels it is less important to keep the monster hidden and build suspense for the big reveal, and that makes sense for films like Jaws 2 or The Lost World. But here, we have never seen this monster before, the Spinosaurus is something completely new. But instead of building up the suspense for the reveal, we see pretty much every angle of it in its first scene. And the design isn't bad or anything, and they did use some pretty impressive animatronics. But like in other movies, they combine the animatronic work with CGI, and the CGI here just isn't that good. I would even go as far as saying that the CGI they used was better in the movie that came out eight years before this one. So after they escape the Spinosaurus, they immediately run into a T-Rex. You all probably know this already, but the Spinosaurus is essentially replacing the T-Rex as the big dinosaur threat for this movie. And in a half-assed attempt to make the Spinosaurus look cooler, they have it kill the T-Rex. Yeah, it doesn't work. And there are multiple things wrong with this. Firstly, the T-Rex was perfect as the big dinosaur threat. You can't outdo it by having another dinosaur come along and kill it. But I'm not saying the T-Rex always has to be the star of the show. By all means, let another dinosaur have the spotlight. But don't try and make your new dinosaur look cool because it can beat the old one. And secondly, and this really is the biggest problem, is the fight is so short and so poorly executed that it leaves such a sour taste when it's over. Because this was the first time two huge dinosaurs fought each other in a Jurassic Park movie. It should have been much bigger than this, and probably at the end of the movie as well, rather than right at the goddamn start. Think more along the lines of the fight at the end of Jurassic World, which is what this scene should have been. So having escaped the Spinosaurus again, they venture further into the jungle towards the coast. When they find the paraglider that Eric was using at the start of the movie. How very convenient. They find the body of the guy that was with him, which makes Amanda freak out. I do wonder how he died though, and how Eric survived. I mean, it must have been little dinosaurs that ate him because he's still hanging from the tree, so did Eric just run away and leave him to die as compies ate him? But anyway, Amanda stumbles onto some raptor eggs, which Billy sneakily steals. After he very quickly repacked the paraglider. So they move on and discover an old InGen building, where they find a raptor. <laughs> Was the raptor just trying to prank her or something? Did the raptor make bets with his friends? The raptors chase them, this guy dies, and the movie shoves how smart these things are down our throats. They set a trap. They actually set a trap. Yes, they are so smart, so fast, and so deadly that they can barely ever catch anyone. They're like the stormtroopers of dinosaurs. Okay, maybe that's a bit harsh. But they do manage to get Alan cornered. However, I sense this was less their intelligence and more his stupidity. But a mysterious person saves him with gas grenades, who is revealed to be, you guessed it, Eric, who has been living on his own in a truck for eight weeks. And they're the ones saving him? They also randomly insert this scene where Eric explains that he got some T-Rex pee which scares off some dinosaurs. But they never do anything with this, they never even mention it again. Was there a deleted scene later in the movie or something? I mean, I could believe there was, this is an incredibly short runtime for a Jurassic Park movie. So as the two groups spend some time resting up, the movie tries to give us some character development. But honestly, do we care? Do we care that they got a divorce, or... Actually, that's about it, really. Well, that and the fact that Eric likes Alan's book, but doesn't like Ian Malcolm's. Yeah, I imagine it's not much of a page-turner unless you're a huge fan of chaos theory. But going back to their breakup, why does almost every Jurassic Park movie have a suffering marriage? Well, not Lex and Tim's parents going through a divorce? Didn't Malcolm divorce Kelly's mother? And then in Jurassic World, Zack and Gray's parents, they were getting a divorce as well. I guess Jurassic Park is just against marriages. Maybe all the writers are just pissed off divorcees. But I digress. As they head towards the coast, Eric hears his dad's satellite phone ringing and runs towards it. He is reunited with his parents, who for some reason wound up on the other side of a fence. Hmm. I wonder how that happened. But then we find out Paul didn't have the phone. He lent it to Nash on the plane, who got eaten. Which means... Right, 
The Spinosaurus just looks goofy in full body shots. There's no denying it. Convenience does seem to strike a lot in this movie, though, doesn't it? First they happen to find the paraglider, then Eric happened to be in the area to save Alan, and now both groups after being separated happen to be in earshot of the Spinosaurus. And while we're at it, there just happens to be a hole in the fence that they can fit through. We discover that the Spinosaurus has no trouble smashing through giant thick steel fences, but what is probably a less secure door... No, the Spino just can't break through that one. Now that they have a bit of a breather, Alan finds the eggs that Billy stole. Now it all makes sense. So the movie explains that the raptors were only hunting them because Billy stole the eggs, which is fine, but they've only had one encounter. And the raptors were hunting them all throughout the last two movies, and nobody stole any eggs there, so... Why do they need a reason here other than they wanted to eat them? I don't know, the line just seems really out of place. Alan goes to throw them away, but decides it would be worse to be caught by the raptors without them. They are almost at the coast, but they have to descend through an aviary to get to the boat, which just so happens to be there. Okay, I'll stop doing that now. Because the stairs are broken, they must go across what looks to be a very unstable bridge one at a time. And this scene actually looks really cool. The mist looks great. It really does. But of course, all does not go to plan as a pteranodon attacks. Oh, would you look at that? The bridge was fine all along. It's funny how things become more stable when you need them to. So they run around in a misty birdcage as the big flying dinosaurs wreak havoc. And this is probably the coolest scene in the entire movie. Not that the earlier scenes set a high bar or anything. I think it just comes down to the fact that we haven't seen flying dinosaurs in a Jurassic Park movie before this. So it's kind of refreshing. But then again, we hadn't seen two huge dinosaurs fight before either. And look how that turned out. Eric is in danger and Billy has to redeem himself for stealing those raptor eggs, so he sacrifices himself in order to save him. He dinosaurs through the sky and does just that. Hey, if the movie can use that joke, so can I! They deem Billy a lost cause and escape to the boat while they peck him to death. And one turns and stares at the camera. No, Mr. Dinosaur, don't stare directly into the camera. It's bad acting. Keep that up and they won't hire you for the next movie. You know, I swear that cool looking mist cleared up pretty quickly, didn't it? When they were on the bridge, you could barely see what was in front of them. Then by the end, it looked pretty damn clear. And don't give me that crap about mist being thicker higher up because not only was it thinner at the bottom, but also on some scenes on the bridge and where Eric was being served up for lunch. So yeah. And I would chalk that up to a nitpick, but I think the scene would look far cooler to watch if the dinosaurs were shrouded in mist, at least more than they were. Alrighty, so now they're on the boat, and the movie has that whimsical, oh look, it's dinosaurs moment that every Jurassic Park movie has to have, apparently. But then as night falls, they hear the phone ringing again but it turns out to be dinosaur poo. Why do I feel like this is a great analogy for how this movie was made? But then terror strikes as a Ceratosaurus attacks. Or should I say, sniffs the shit and walks off. I feel like that dinosaur represents the audience in this movie. They return to the boat and they have enough power in the phone to make one call. But can you see what I see? I mean really try your hardest, harder than you've ever tried at anything, and you will see that it's raining and it's night time. Which can only mean one thing. Is the big dinosaur attack at night while raining scene? Because what would a Jurassic Park movie be without one of those? Why wouldn't they have already have checked the boxes on the boat for any items that could possibly be useful? It's like the first thing you would do after getting to the boat. But anyway, they do find a flare gun and as the oil spills out into the river they ignite it and the Spinosaurus runs away. I would call this anticlimactic, but that would imply there was some kind of build-up. 
But I just want to point this out. When Paul was on the crane, his reaction here was just priceless. <laughs> it's about the only thing I like about this scene. Well, that's not completely true, because I'd be lying if I didn't say some of the shots of the Spinosaurus attacking were cool to see. And as day breaks, they hear the ocean, but are immediately surrounded by raptors as they demand their eggs back. Which they then give them their eggs back, and Alan uses his new little toy, which he got at the start of this movie, and it mimics the resonating chamber of a velociraptor. So he uses it to trick the raptors into thinking another raptor is calling for help. I'd just like to reiterate how much this movie, and indeed the whole Jurassic Park franchise, points out how smart these creatures are. So the raptors leave them and they discover there is a man on the beach. Why would they send one man ahead of everyone else to get their attention? I know they wanted to create a cool image, but I think making some sort of sense is also important. So the rescue party is here in force, and it's all because of Ellie, who Alan called while the Spinosaurus was attacking. And considering how briefly they got to talk on the phone, it's amazing that she worked out exactly where Alan was. And how did this incredibly large rescue party that she was able to summon know exactly where they were on this island? And speaking of unbelievable coincidences, the rescue party found Billy, who somehow survived, I don't know why he had to survive, but he did. And the movie ends with a small recreation of the ending scene from the first movie. Only this time, instead of birds flying peacefully next to the helicopter, it's the big flying dinosaurs as somebody left the aviary door open. Why are they playing this like it's such a happy moment? We've all seen how vicious these things are, shouldn't they be a little bit more alarmed than this? But then again, they couldn't even finish Billy off, so maybe the danger isn't that bad. So Jurassic Park 3 was... <sighs> it was the worst sequel of the lot, in my opinion, and its biggest crime is that it just feels so empty. The first two movies had a message, a topic to discuss, science versus nature, animal cruelty. They had a purpose. This film is just a movie for the sake of a movie. And while there are some nice references to the books, such as the river attack and aviary scenes, which were actually scrapped ideas for the first movie as well, it still feels phoned in. Which is the perfect way to sum up this movie. It is a phoned in Jurassic Park movie. Which isn't to say that the acting is bad. I mean, yes, Amanda was annoying at times, but that was all the writing and direction. The actual acting was fine. And it's always nice to hear the classic Jurassic Park theme, but the dinosaurs look worse than they ever have done, and have much less of an impact on you than they have done in the earlier movies. Overall, I just think that this movie was forced into existence and reeks of cut-down scenes such as the T-Rex fight, which leaves you wanting more, but not in a good way. You have been watching Good or Bad, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.